Hey there, welcome to Nippy Nivers. Something I have thought about today is to separate uh, the ASX Daily Rundown video into two sections. One section where I answer your questions and I think I probably would release this portion of the video once a week, more than likely on a Saturday, replacing my portfolio update video. And that way, when I actually do that ASX Daily Rundown, it would be uh, a true rundown of video just to see what has happened on the market during that day. And I can decrease the time of those videos below 20 minutes, hopefully. But I do ramble on sometimes. So let's start looking at some or answering some of your comments that you have released on uh, three or four of my previous videos. So I'm in, I'm in YouTube studio right here. So I go back looking at uh, some of your comments released in the last five videos. So I might be able to do this for every single video release. So if you actually do uh, have a question, just put it in any video. So let's go back to the 21st of March uh, daily rundown video, and let's have a look at some of your questions. Starting right down the bottom. Now, this is not a question from Jonathan Williams. And um, I think this is a good question or comment. I really started watching this channel and has been really helpful. I'm doing the ASX schools share market game. And these videos have been really good for understanding how it all works. Thanks. Now, what's interesting about that is potential age of Jonathan Williams. The best time investing is the day you're born. Now, more than likely, you don't have the skills to invest the day you're born. Possibly your parents do or your grandparents. But that is the time to start investing. And if you can't invest on that day or your parents uh, don't have the knowledge, the best time to start is as soon as possible. I'm pretty sure Warren Buffett started investing when he was like eight years old, maybe nine or 10. Uh, and that is probably my biggest regret when it comes to investing, that I didn't start earlier. Um, and I had a little bit of money back in the day and I should have started investing then. I My life could be completely different. So trying to get into investments as early as possible is great. I have not done this ASS ASX schools share market game. No idea what that is, but if they do have that sort of thing, that could only help you to learn more about investing. So congratulations, Jonathan Williams. I have no doubt you'll become a successful investor. Definitely, particularly if you have a passion in regards to investing uh, by the time you turn my age, which will be in like three years time because I'm only 23 years old. Uh, let's go on to the next question. I have Western African resources and hope it will go well. I remember reading this question before. That's like that question from Simon PT. Thoughts on Paladin Energy. Okay, it's uranium. I should get my keyboard up here. It's uranium. We do know that because it's in the question and I know what Paladin Energy does. Not in production yet. It's been on the precipice of pre production for many, many years. This was a cut. Let's have a look at my month chart. This company was a beloved uranium company way back in 2007. Share price of the uh, platinum went all the way up to $9.50. In fact, if you bought, and I heard stories about this, people buying Palladian or Paladin at like three cents and then uh, maybe not selling it at the top, but uh, being a massive wealth winner for those people who held on during that period. Uh, and then you can see what happened when we had the downturn in uranium, particularly around uh february 2021 when was that fukushima whatever it's called uh a, um disaster the uh what do you call it the um tsunami etc pretty sure that was in early 2011 and that coincides maybe march 2011 and that coincides when the share price of paladin just fell like a rock and the second time it fell like a rock and now we're seeing more life in paladin mark up of this company is pretty big 4.13 billion jeez uh, the chart looks chart looks fine. The chart looks nice. Even though uranium has been under pressure, um, we've seen probably less pressure on Paladin, which probably shows you there's more strength in this company. So the market likes Paladin right now. Uh, the, the chart looks beautiful. Other than that, I know nothing about Paladin. I know nothing about the resources or anything like that. Um, in these sort of companies, I only play the chart. And to be honest with you, we don't know how long this uranium bull market is going to go. It could be at the end of it right now. It could go for another 20 years. Uh, more than likely not, uh, but we just don't know. And this was another case where I was too early. Probably my biggest problem over the last 10 years has I've been too early in trends. And then I 
see eventually the trend plays out exactly as I think, but I'm no longer in the trend because I've sold out and took profits at a small, because if you're holding a company for a very long period of time, the share price does nothing. And then the share price starts to go up. You get excited. You sell, take that profit because it's done nothing for a long period of time. But if you enter the trade really soon after share price starts increasing, you're willing to ride the trend much longer. I've learned that lesson. Uh, so sometimes I live it too early the trends. I was with uranium. I was in uranium all guns blazing about three or four years ago. Okay, so that's Paladin. Uh, let's have a look at the next question. Mate, I think you shouldn't worry about the length of your videos. Oh, seven, seven thumbs up for this one. Let's put it to eight. Impatient traders usually fail. Can't be asked watching longer content. Says a lot. If you're over 10 minutes, YouTube is happy anyway. You've mentioned that you like doing these videos because it helps. That's perfect. Don't listen to haters. Do what's right for you and listen to your rules. And I'm pretty sure Liam Jones is uh, all about timestamps. Not everyone is invested in every single area and focused on certain things. Time is fine, but timestamps are needed. I would like to do timestamps. And it does annoy me when I am watching a podcast, or not watching, listening to a podcast or watching a YouTube video, and there's not timestamps on it. Uh, but that's just me. But uh, I would like to keep these daily rundown videos uh, to about 20 minutes. Uh, that's just me. And um, the reason I go for 40 minutes or even longer is just because I have I can just talk about investing all day. I could literally do a six-hour investing video or podcast, and I will still have things to talk about. So thank you, Ryan Hillman. Eight thumbs up. Rahul Kayan. Sorry about Rahul. Rahul. Rahul Kalyan. Sorry about butchering your name. You get a thumbs up. Hi, Nappy. Thank you for the great video again. And don't worry about the videos being too long. They are perfect as they are. And you do this because you want, want to, not because you have to. Well, that's true. I wouldn't do these videos if I don't want to. That would be silly. So do whatever makes you enjoyable. And we'll be happy too. Hopes everyone is happy. Also, because I am very young, I'd like to gain control of my super and take a similar, similar stance like in the video by investing them into high quality companies. Would this be a good thing to do at my age because the funds would have decades to grow and would logically give great returns with some ups and downs in the balance every few years? What advice would you give for this topic as a percentage of super to use for this approach because superhero doesn't let you go all in on direct investment with your super? Also, would high quality companies like Apple, Microsoft, maybe NVIDIA when it drops uh, CTD possibly be appropriate. Thank you again. And apologies for such a long comment. When I realized that uh, you can take full control of your super innovation, not quite SMSF. So I my super is in net wealth. So it's not SMSF. They do everything. And I can invest in individual companies. I only need, is it 1% in cash? I think that's it's about 1% in cash, something like that. And I can invest in every almost every company in the world. My only thing I don't like about net wealth is $18 trades and on international trades, I might be like $34. I highly recommend doing that if you have the passion for investing and you're willing to take the time to find high quality companies like I do. I think that's a great strategy. Now, more than likely, there's other platforms that have this style of investing. So I started with Australian Super. They let me do it, but only for ASX 300 companies. I want to invest in more than ASX 300 companies. Then I found net wealth. I'm pretty sure Hub24 has it. And I did, or I transferred. I started using net wealth about four years ago. I'm not looking back. I like it. I think it's a great way to invest. So you don't really have to rely on the funds and the performance of the funds. And I think a lot of people have the problem is they look at the best performing funds one year and then or the best whatever and then transfer them their super to that fund. And then the next year, that fund might not perform the best. Just because a fund performs really well one year doesn't mean it performs really well the next year. Um, so I really like that sort of approach. That's for me. I realize it's not for everyone because I tried to explain what return on equity was to some colleagues uh, and they just had no idea. And that's the thing. There's a lot of people out there uh, that have no idea about investing. Again, the lack of financial education in this country, and I think in every country, is highly lacking. There are reasons behind that. I've already been on a rant behind that, reasons behind that. And funnily enough, I read an article the other day complaining about fire people, you know, 
financial independence retire early, saying they're destroying economies around the world. And that just shows you that this perception that you need to work and spend your money to be a successful part of the community and society is, and that's completely wrong. Do what works for you. Do what you want to do. Don't think what you do might be harmful for the economy because that's what the governments want you to think. Um, that's me being really cynical. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sivan. Just wanted to add to the praise. Really appreciate these videos. Do not, don't mind at all that they are longer. I knew very minimal about investing until this channel. Thank you. I won't go. In, I shouldn't go into full detail or read all these comments because then this uh, uh, question or answer and question show will be very long. But thank you for your comment, Savan. Uh, Blacktop images. I've been mulling over Sol, which is W H Sol Patterson or Washington H Sol Patterson for weeks now. But then I found Infratel IFT. I'm pretty sure that's Infratel. It looks a better buy for the longer term. I'm pretty sure Infratel has a brilliant looking long term chart. I'm pretty sure this is an infrastructure company. And yeah, that chart is a brilliant long-term chart. Highly liquid back in 11, between 2011 and 15. This is the example of a highly liquid company becoming more and more liquid. This is the definition of a high-quality chart. Uh, infrastructure companies, not my favorite sort of companies, but whatever floats your boat. And to be honest with you, you can't go wrong. With this sort of chart doesn't mean the share price will continue into this uptrend forever but if you got in because of a chart looking like this back in 2019 at say four dollars you're probably very happy at ten dollars so and the returns you're not going to get that high with this sort of company uh so do -do. i would assume because it's, it's an infrastructure company it has a pretty high price to earnings ratio it says the price to earnings ratio is 5.85 dividend of 1.84 there's some reason behind that. More than likely, yeah. Profit of 1.1 billion in the first half of financial year 21 is probably over-exaggerated for some reason. It could have been a one-off. Uh, could have been some sort of uh, like a, a um, revaluation of some assets. I don't know. But Infratel is a company I've never had a look at. I just know they're in infrastructure. But what sort of infrastructure do they do? Ownership of of an infrastructure business which provides services to individuals and communities, writes through the following business segments, Trust Power, Tilt Renewables, Wellington International Airport, Diagnostic Imaging. They have a lot going on here. Hmm. Probably should look at Inf Infratel a little bit closer. So thank you, Blacktop Images, for giving us the idea of Infratel, a high-quality company, just by the chart, uh, and it does look interesting. Uh, Vin Hilly, I'm grateful for your videos. Anyway, you decide to make them. Neps, thank you. Let's like, let's like all these videos. Uh, okay, Kirat Singh, I know that you're a legend. Well, I'm not sure about a legend. Even my wife recognizes your voice now. I'm not, not sure that's a good thing. You know, one of the reasons I started doing videos is because at work I was on TV. Uh, so if you go back, if you remember between about 2011, 2010, and about 2021, I was on TV presenting on occasion, not a lot, but on occasion I would, um, the TV channels would come in and I'll sit down and record some videos. And I hated watching myself on TV because I had my voice. And one of the ways to solve that is just to record videos and listen, because you have to edit your videos and just listen to yourself speak. And I tell you what, it solved that problem. I don't mind my voice anymore. It's sort of like a normal voice. Anyway, so I apologize that your wife recognizes my voice. Always excited when you upload long videos, so much information and great insights, and really digging chart analysis. TA is definitely exciting. It excites me. My question to you is, as markets have been running hard since October, November, and eventually run out of steam, possibly, we don't know the future, are you booking profits and sitting with some cash to re-enter? Obviously, time in the market is greater than timing the market, but one can still try and take some profits home. I just let it happen naturally. I actually am sitting on a large amount of cash right now, but that does not mean I'm bearish. Uh, if I'd have no cash, that doesn't mean I'm bullish. I've just, um, in the past two or three weeks, I have taken profits on some trades and I've just bid up my cash reserves and I just have a bit of cash now sitting and I'm looking for opportunities. I've seen the opportunities. I will uh, take those opportunities because I have no idea what's going to happen to the market. This could be the start of a massive long-term bull run. We just don't know. So that's another reason why I think technical analysis is important because 
you can actually see um, which way the market is heading in the short term, even medium term, just by how bullish the market is or bearish the market is. So that's another reason why I te like technical analysis. And I also agree timing the market, but timing the market is also important. And I discovered that in early 2020, just by listening to some macro people. I think I've talked about this. There's a podcast. There was a podcast when the markets was at all time high. When was it early February? I listened to this podcast in regards to what was happening in China. What this guy said came almost exactly to what happened. And that really made me decide because it also answered a lot of the questions I had in regards to what was happening in China. And a lot of other people were saying, or just poo pooing, this is nothing. What's happening in China? It's not going to affect the rest of the world. And this person said, what's happening in China will 100% happen, occur in the rest of the world. He just didn't know how bad it was going to be. And it was bad. So, uh, so he was talking about the lockdowns. This guy was a macro guy and he wanted understanding of it. So he went to, not went to, but he found these nodule people who went to these conferences in China. And he, there was a lot of information just in this podcast. I was meaning to share this podcast. I still have it on my own phone, that particular podcast. So I have my own phone. So I can actually share that with you if you want. Hacho says, I called Electro Optics at 48 cents, now $2. I did get out $1.60. So definitely missed the top. Always going to miss the top and the bottoms more than likely. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. Uh, when they say you can't time the market, you can't absolutely perfectly time the market, but you can get much of the upturn or much of the um, the upside um, by buying at 10% or 20% behind or after the breakout or after share price has moved into the uptrend. Uh, so that's something that is a miss. It's sort of like, a, yeah, it's a myth that you can't perfectly time the market. Therefore, technical analysis doesn't work. I've actually heard that before. You can't time the market, therefore technical analysis doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. So Hacho is right um, that you get greedy in the game and you'll be left with nothing. That's true. I've had this problem before where, in fact, I did a video on this. And one of the reasons why my AccuSensus trade didn't quite work out the way I wanted to, because I got a little bit too greedy in the end. I had a 10% return, even I think it was a 15% return. When I should have taken profits, that was my end game. And then I thought, well, maybe I could get 20%. And then we had the bad announcement. Share price dropped. And I think even though there's a question, there's a there's a thing that says, let your profits run. There's another one said, you can't go broke taking profits, but you want to get a good balance between those two sayings. Let your profits run, but then take profits. Uh, so I definitely will take profits in my trading strategy when I become comfortable taking profits. When I think I've gotten as much as I can out of that particular trade. And Hacho thought he got as much as he could out of EOS at $1.60. Had a good gain. Uh, anyway, I think the share price will drop to about $1.80 on open, either on Monday or Tuesday when um, they have a successful placement. When we got confirmation that Electro Optics has that placement, that's when trading should begin. Okay, let's go to a standalone video on next year. And there was one comment, only one comment, but 30 likes. So a lot of people like that video, but only one person responded. First come up time I've come across your Nepi's video, great analysis, hits all the selling points. Woven into the reports, I'll be tracking this site closely. Thank you, Herdsman Lake. Okay, uh, next, uh, this the last of the daily rundown videos, three breakouts to watch, only seven comments in this one. So let's have a look, starting at the bottom. Robert John Reed, a new viewer, viewer over here in Perth. Very impressive. Thank you, John Reed. I should actually like this comment from the one person who left a comment on the Nexium video. I have thumbs up. The only thumbs up. Okay, let's go back to my recent daily rundown video, looking at three breaks out. So thank you, Robert John Reed. Let's like all these comments. Oops. Uh, Janks, I'm really enjoying your channel, Nepi. You said you only trade liquid stocks, but I believe you're also trading shape, which is quite illiquid. That is absolutely true. Now, I am less likely to trade illiquid stocks. Uh, so that is one of my rules. But on companies like shape, where I have a little bit higher conviction, I am willing to trade these a little bit more. Um, so I do have shape and I do have a few other companies that would be considered a little bit more liquid, 
And I have done quite well out of that strategy over the past few years. So Shape is probably the most illiquid company I am trading on my or in my trading strategy. So I won't completely rule out illiquid companies, but I want to mostly focus on illiquid companies. Oh, fo mostly focus on liquid companies like as I showed you or told you before or last week that I traded or am trading at Tours and Fisher and Paykel and what was it like 800,000 Fisher and Paykel trades uh, shares trade or trades made compared to eight for Boom Logistics. Um, and I have much less conviction around Boom Logistics than I do Shape. And one of the reasons why I was surprised with my dividend in regards to my trading portfolio is because I received a really nice dividend in Shape and Shape share price is still going higher, even taking into account dividend. Kirat Singh, breakout series sounds exciting. Looking forward to it. If two holds above $4 in the next two or three training days, I'll definitely jump in. Okay. Whatever works for you. I think that's the most important thing is find what works for you. So in my technical update video, I showed you, uh, which I released because I plan to release this on the morning of the 25th of March. In that video, I showed you 20 possibilities. I shared with you 20 training possibilities and more than likely, some of those possibilities you might like, some of those possibilities I don't like, but you might like. So that what drives the market. We all have different opinions, thoughts, different trades, investments, and that's the only way a market works because we're all different. If we're all the same, market wouldn't work or NVIDIA would be worth $5,000 trillion. Nice00742 has two comments. Thanks for the video. Any scanner used to alerts on breakouts? The only scanner I, well, actually, no. Okay, there's no scanner I found that I like in terms of breakouts. So the way I look at breakouts, um, the best scanner is, and this is, might be unorthodox, the best scanner is announcements, ASX announcements. So one of my uh, conditions, it's not a complete condition this, uh, as complete as the other two conditions. So my three conditions are positive financial news, uh, share price at least a six month high and high volume and on the breakout. And the positive financial news uh, comes in relation to announcement, which I read every single day. So I do find a lot of breakouts happen coincidentally, maybe coincidentally, but coinciding, that's a better word, coinciding with positive financial news. So in a way that is a, is a, a scanner, but I have been trying to find a screener or screener. I've been trying to find a screener uh, for a breakout, uh, training view. I do use Finviz, but that's an unusual volume screener only on the American markets. There's a few screeners I use in trading view, six month high screener, one year high screener. There is also an unusual volume screener in trading view that I can remember. And um, so there are quite a few places where there are screeners. Also have tried a pro TA, pro, what's it called? Pro TA or something. Pro technical analysis. You have to pay $700 or something. That could be useful if I could find some screener in that. Uh, I don't know. Your other question, how do you decide specific amount that you invest is it 2%? Let me like all these comments. Is it 2% of your portfolio in every trade? It all depends on my conviction. So for instance, Atlas Pearls, I, I bought into position a position in that last August, a very small position because my conviction on that trade was quite small. Uh, it was funny enough that maybe I should have higher conviction because bought at $5 or 5.7 cents, sold at 21 cents or 20.5 cents, share price more than tripled over less than a six month period. And even though that's really good gains, if I had more conviction, I would have got a better return. So high convictions, I've put a little bit more, lower convictions, a little bit less. And my plan in the future is when I do take an initial position and I see another breakout, I just add to my position. So that position could increase. Uh, I don't use a percentage of my portfolio, but to be honest, if I add up my portfolio right now, I would never take an initial position more than 1%. Yes, yes, that's me, yeah, more than 1%, yeah. Yep, yep, just doing the quick maths in my head, never more than 1% of my overall portfolio, investment portfolio. Raven, Raven, 
Small caps might move. Thanks, it might. It might. Don't know. It might. It's looking good right now. And nine slide glide, VLS, which I'm, I think is Vita Life, Uni, which is Universal Stores, FID, which is Fiducian. A three more charts looking promising, reaching 52 weeks highs in recent days. I'm going to show you all three charts, all three towards a high end of the quality spectrum as well. Aligned management, growing earnings, and all in a net cash position. Let's show you the chart of all three. And, all th and I'll tell you one thing. I own one of these companies in my quality portfolio. Another is one of these companies I nearly took a trading position in and the other one, not quite. So let's start with the one not quite, and that's the Vita Life Sciences. Okay, and the chart looks actually pretty good for this one. So this is the weekly chart, by the way. And you notice um, the share price of this company just goes up and wide, down and wide. It's really volatile, but the trend lasts for a long time, and you can just ride this trend forever. So you could have bought this company at a price of 55 cents in July 2020 and sold it for $2.60 two years later. And just by looking at the chart, it looks really well. I did notice the share price broke out on the 26th of February when they released their results. That was a really good result, if I remember correctly. Share price increased 17.3% on that day. That was a time to get in. Uh, share price has now gone higher since then. A beautiful looking chart. Uh, not only a one-year high, we're talking about a two-year high. And it's getting to the highs we saw back in early 2022. So a beautiful looking chart. You might say more illiquid than the other two. Uh, but at this point in time, the chart looks really good for Vita Life Sciences. For those who don't know, this company sells stuff. Stuff to do with health. Uh, vitamins and supplements, yeah. The markup is 133.8 million. So not a big company, but they are profitable. P ratio 14.5. Nice growth in revenue in the last half year. Uh, so nice growth. And it's been profitable the last five half years. Uh, so it's a nice small company on the ASX. Now let's have a look at Universal, a company I nearly bought last week. I'm very close to buying this at $5. And I wish I hit the trigger because this company broke out again on the half year results. Uh, on the 22nd of February, $4.60. I should have bought on that day or the next five days because the share price remained above the breakout level. That's a good sign moving forward. And the share price has gone on a tear. I nearly bought at $5 at the start of the week. Share price slipped a little bit on the 19th of March, below $5. That was the day I was going to buy. Share price currently $5.27. I've not ruled out trading this company either. Uh, so another company that's on my radar. It's a dividend yield, 4.65%. Price earnings ratio, 15.3. Nice growth. This is one of those retail companies that had growth in revenue from that. Pretty sure I had a growth. Let's have a look. I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, it did have growth. Yeah. Revenue one year ago was 150, 146 million. And this revenue this latest half year was 158 million. So this company is a growing retail company. A lot of other companies or retail companies are not growing. And they have a store rollout plan as well, which is exciting. So a definite company to put on your radar. And finally, the company I own in my high quality portfolio. I don't really follow the chart for this company all closely. And I wish I had because, and again, the other two companies broke out on the release of the half year results or maybe four year results, depending on uh, the calendar. This company broke out on the half year results. I had a look at their results. And I went, oh, this is pretty good. But I didn't look at the chart. I should have looked at the chart. I mentioned the share price had pulled back into the nice little support zone. I'm pretty sure I mentioned this company in a video recently. Pulled back, a beautiful buy the dip opportunity, not a lot of volume. And it's just gone on a tear again. It's gone from $6.50 to $7.60 in about four or five trading days. A beautiful looking chart. So let's have a look at the weekly chart. So why would I define this company as high quality? Now, if you go all the way back from when this company list on the ASX back in 2015, share price, beautiful uptrend from then all the way through to the highs in 2022. A little bit of a pullback in the share price because the market thought this sort of company would be negatively affected by like recessions or depressions. Uh, and even though they did have a little bit of pullback in their revenue or profit, uh, it's gone back to growth. Uh, Markup, 239 million. So this is a small cap company. And I was really surprised to hear in a podcast or something, someone had never, uh, an expert had never heard of this company. It's like, how can you have never heard of this company? This is a profitable small cap company that is growing. Sort of company everyone should have heard of. And I'm pretty sure maybe they would have said, oh, this is just a lobster pot. 
you can easily get in, but you can't get out. And whenever an expert says that, I just sort of ignore them. Um, not completely, but they just lose all, um, not relevance, but I ignore them for like a minute. Anyway, now dividend yield of 4.8, nice dividend yield. This company's going to keep on growing, in my opinion. Uh, a PR ratio of only 17.1, which is a little bit higher than it was not that long ago when they had a PR ratio of like 10. Uh, and just looks, let's have a look at their financials. So if you look at the yearly, so revenues have increased from 50 million to 73 million in the last five years. Profit has increased from 10 million to 12 million. And if you look at the half year numbers, they increase every single half year. And the last half year profit is up to 6.8 million, revenue 39 million. It's just a consistent growth trajectory for this company. This is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's why I bought this company and just decided I'm going to keep this company in my high quality portfolio and just hope it keeps on. And when I say hope, that's based off probability that it keeps on growing over the next five to 10 years. And maybe in five or 10 years, this company has a valuation of over $1 billion and I get a really nice dividend yield out of it. There is that possibility. Okay, let's go to portfolio update video. And then we also look at Sonic Healthcare. Someone didn't like my portfolio update video. One dish like. So rude. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Champ Cali. Champ of Cali. Do the updates monthly? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to do that. I do updates daily, the portfolio updates daily. So I can do this video or at least this video on a Saturday. Not today. This is released on a Monday. Advantage of weekly updates is that you can describe your trades. I can do that on the ASX daily rundown video. Uh, actually, actually do that. Otherwise, monthly updates should be fine. Anything is good value. Really enjoying the daily ASX podcast the most. Uh, maybe I should do or release those on podcasts. Thank you, Shelley Dugmore. Let's go back to the previous video. Did I like all those video, all those comments? Yes, I did. And finally, to the last video I have released, Sonic Healthcare Financial Year 23 results. I record that video really quickly. So hopefully that was a good quality video. No one's disliked it. 30 likes. What is really interesting, the Nexium group, so the standalone videos, Nexium group and Sonic Healthcare actually gets more likes, less views, but more likes than the other videos. That's what I've just seen here. Although the ASX Daily Rundown video on the 21st of March had 46 likes and no dislikes. Okay. Okay, let's go and have a look at Sonic Healthcare. Okay, great company for the watch list. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you for the import. You're welcome, Nirvana. You're welcome, Kurt Cobain. Thanks for covering Anderson 6379. Thank you. You always leave comments. Thank you. And Agent 8627, the last comment I'll be talking about. And maybe there's a question. You haven't actually looked at these comments yet. Hi, Nepi Invests. Three years ago, you did a video on how to read a 4C and what you look for. I use your technique all the time reading 4Cs. One day you could do a video on how you read an annual report and what you look for. Since following you, my training skills have improved out of sight. Thanks, Nepi. Nepi. For your videos, it is much appreciated. Apart from the spilling of my name, I'm going to give you a like, and I could do a video on how I read annual reports. Now, in saying all that, I am not an accountant. So sometimes I get confused when I read an annual report. I go, what are they doing here? What have they done here? But I do generally, when I look at an annual report, and I'm still going through annual reports that were not annual reports, um, half-year reports that were released in February. I'm still going through a lot of those. I tend to follow the same script every single time. I don't look at the presentation or media announcements. I go straight to the financial statements. And I have a few things I look for. So definitely can do a video on that, Agent 627. Okay. So that's all I got for this particular video, answering some of your comments. So leave any questions you have in any video that I do release between now, actually between Sunday, the 24th of March, and Friday, the 29th of March. And I'll try to answer all your videos on a video I release on the 30th of March. Have a good day. Hope you had a great weekend. Hope you have a great week. And talk to you soon. See you later.